Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh brothers and sisters and friends This is brother Hamza Andres Sozis, this is brother Sabur Ahmed And this is the Facebook live, I apologize it was supposed to start yesterday but we had to reschedule And usually on my Facebook lives, I haven't done many but usually it's just been me and you But now we have brother Sabur today as well and we're going to be talking about the fitrah, the innate disposition, the primordial state and first principles and how that relates to metaphysics, truth, the concept of certainty, the concept of guidance in Islam. We're going to apply the idea of the fitrah and first principles to Islamic epistemology and all of these things, okay? So to start us off, let me just speak to Sabor and ask him, so why are we talking about this and what are we going to be talking about? Okay. A little bit more detail. Okay. So. There's a misconception out there, which is that if only I can figure out this rational algorithm, if only I can refute this atheist argument, I can get my Iman back. If only this particular person, for example, Stephen Hawking, he was so intelligent, why didn't he become Muslim? So this whole idea that there's some sort of rational um, formula that as soon as you uncover it, you get like guidance from above. So what we want to do is we want to take it back to first principles here. So do we need absolute rational deductive evidence for the existence of God before we can say God exists? Do we have to first doubt God's existence before we start believing in God and these sorts of things? So the whole thing breaks down to first principles. Okay, good. So from that point of view, let's introduce the idea of first principles. So give me one first principle, then I'll give you another. Let's start bouncing some first principles so people can understand what first principles are. So give okay. me an example of first principles. Okay. So, for example, the idea of morality, right? Now, that's a very big hot potato right now. You know, this is wrong, this is right. I feel people from, you know, whether you're Buddhist, Christian, atheist, Taoist, Lady Gaga, you're going to have some form of right and wrong. Yes. But if somebody was to actually break it down and try to do a sort of test on right and wrong, put it through a test tube or just try and measure it, how are you going to do that? You either have to start off with, you know, it makes sense, there's objective morals, or you say they're subjective, but foundationally, how are you going to prove that there is such a thing as okay? Good. So, morality? so this this revolves around the area of metaethics, moral ontology, which is the view that you know morals have a particular nature and they have a source and a foundation. So, from that point of view, you're saying if someone believes in objective morals, well, they just have to start with that principle and then build their kind of moral world view yeah. based upon that principle. Absolutely. And the thing is, most people have never, have, they've never actually even thought about objective morality, but they do subconsciously believe in that, which is why they keep going back to, it's wrong. And you ask them why, and they're like, it, it just is. And that basically subconsciously, they do believe in some form of okay. objective morals. Let's bring in a, a one that explains the idea of first principles a little bit more clearly. Another idea of first principles would be, for example, in science. In science, and what I mean by first principles here is you have first principles and you have also assumptions. So non-negotiable assumptions that you adopt and you believe to be true in order for your fear, sphere of knowledge or your field of knowledge to make sense. So in science, you have to believe, generally speaking, that nature is uniform, right? So if you observe, say, 50% of the universe and gravity is working, based upon the first principle or the assumption that nature is uniform, therefore... Gravity permeates the whole of the universe, yep. for example. Another first principle or assumption of science is that there are external causal connections in the world. Yep. That there are causes and effects, which is fine, you could observe them, but you can't observe causality itself. What is the causal link between the cause and the effect? This is an area of metaphysics, an area of first principles that you discuss in philosophy, and they haven't really even agreed on what the causal link, if you have a... David Hume's perspective, you'll have, you, you might even say there is no cause and effect, right? Anyway, that's neither here or there. So that's another first principle. Give, also, give, give me another one. I think the most basic one is deductive logic. So for example, we have Hamza is a mortal, that's an assumption, and all mortals are made of cells. So therefore Hamza is made of cells. Now that logic and the way that it goes down, uh, the way that you get from premise, premise to a conclusion, necessarily... How, why is that the case? Okay, so you're saying in deductive logic, that conclusion that you just made necessarily follows. Okay, good. So the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. There is a, ne a logical necessary link between the premises and the conclusion. So you're saying 
why is that the case? But why is that the case? Well, the thing is, that's going back to first principles. That's just something you have to accept. So you have to accept that this is how deductive logic works. Yeah. What if I don't accept it? Well, then you'll have to basically throw out the baby with the bathwater. You can't do any, any form of rationalism because using inductive logic or deductive logic, you, we use it all the time, but when we try to justify it, you cannot actually just justify it in a non-circular way. What I mean by that is this. So, for example, why is it that we have uh, premise, premise leading to this conclusion? Why? Well, if you ask why and you try to figure out why that's the case, then we can ask why is that the case and why is that the case and you get to an infinite regress. So, with this logical reasoning, you have to accept the rules of logic. And once you accept the rules of the game, then you could play the logical game. But you but can't justify them. Yeah, but the rules are not the game. Yeah. And you can't justify the rules using the game because the game needs the rules. Absolutely. Okay, good. So in logical reasoning, you have first principles. In science, you have first, f first principles. In morality, you have first principles or assumptions that you need to adopt to understand the whole world. So we get the idea of first principles. So the point is, everything has a first principle. Everything has an assumption. Yeah. That's from science, even to neuroscience. It's even to the philosophy of biology, you talk about it all the time in, in the Darwinian mechanism, you have an assumption which is called the G gradualism, right? So you have assumptions in everything, right? And first principles. Obviously, assumptions of first principles do differ, and they're slightly different, but I think for the point of this discussion, you get what we're trying to say. Now, how does this relate now to what we just said previously? Okay, I think a good way to bring it in is this. Many years ago, when I used to live uh, in a different part of the country, there was a local corner shop which used to sell cigars. These are the really small cigars, which are, you know, the really harmful ones. Now, there's a person who used to come into the shop to buy the cigar, and he himself was actually a lung surgeon. Now, being a lung surgeon, do you think he knows the effect that that cigar actually has on the lungs? Of course he does. So, rationally, he knows this is actually bad for him. But does that mean he's going to follow his rationality? Not, ne not necessarily. Now... You may be thinking, what's this example got to do with anything? Well, it's all related to the existence of God. Someone may know all the rational arguments for God, yet they may disbelieve in God. And there may be someone who has no rational arguments for God, but they believe in God. So it's not the rationality itself which makes you disbelieve or believe in God. It's basically whether you want to accept that. And what this is related to is the fitra. Okay, so you're saying now... So rationality is a means, not an end. Of course. Okay? And this relates to our first principle, which is the fitra. The fitra is the innate nature, the primordial state. And within the fitra, you have a form of knowledge, right? One form of knowledge is the existence of Allah, that He's a reality, and that He deserves praise. If you, if you recall the hadiths of the Prophet wasallam, when they were listening for the adhan, for the call to prayer in nearby areas, the Adhan will go, which is the call to prayer, and then they would say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, which is God is greater, God is greater. And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is fitrah. Yeah? And then when they continued the call of prayer, they basic, he basically said, this is Islam. So there's a distinction between the innate nature and Islam. Anyway, neither here or there for this point, but the point here is, so is the fitrah is the innate nature created by God that's within us, that has primary, primary form of knowledge, which is that Allah is a reality and that He deserves praise. So that's our first principle. So what you're saying here, therefore, is rationality, therefore, is not an end. It's just a means to awaken that truth within us. Absolutely. But why does it need to be awakened? Okay, that's a, that's a very good question. Now, there's many different ways the fitra can be covered. It's always there, but it can be covered. It so can, the, the fitra does get covered, yeah? It does get covered. Now, we know through a narration of the Prophet ﷺ that Salah. every child is born upon the fitra. fitra. And then their parents make them either into a Christian, a Jewish person, or a Zoroaster, and so forth. So it's the society which covers up the fitra. Now the fitra is covered up there, but it can get uncovered, reminded, if you like, the truth within can get awoken by direct communication with revelation, with rational arguments, sometimes by introspection, thinking about questions like, how long am I going to be alive? And sometimes it can come out during times of extreme distress, and of course, rational argumentation. Someone gives you a logical argument and you're like, wow, I never thought about that. Okay, so you have this fitra. This fitra is clouded or covered because of wrong education, socialization, etc. as per the prophetic tradition in Sahih Muslim. That can get uncovered by what? Reason, rationality, direct contact with revelation, 
personal experiences, spiritual experiences, introspection, introspection, reflection. So therefore, these different ways of unclouding or awakening or uncovering the fitra, they become means to awaken the truth within, yes. right? Okay, good. So therefore, what you said in the beginning is true. There is no rational algorithm that you put together and all of a sudden you have faith, you have this spiritual conviction, yeah? So, so, so if someone is really intelligent, so say, so say hypothetically, I play devil's advocate, I say, well, but this person was so intelligent, they knew everything that they had to know about, you know, say the universe, or they knew all the physical facts about the universe. Why didn't this intelligent person become Muslim? So how would you answer it based upon what we just said? Okay. One thing I like to do is before answering the question directly in a religious context is take it to a secular context. We could ask the exact same question about someone who's very intelligent and who's a lung surgeon who carries on smoking cigars. He's so intelligent, Good why question. is he smoking cigars? Now, he may justify it to himself. No, 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 it's not really bad for you or so on and so forth. The thing is that reason doesn't, doesn't exist on its own in a vacuum. It always interacts with the human heart. It always interacts with a sort of state of being, right? So when a person gets rationality, he gets a rational argument, and they want to believe in God, they are open to the existence of God, they will believe in God. But there's somebody who does not want to believe in God, no amount of rational argumentation is going to move them. Yeah, so it's not got to do with not, your intelligence. We're not functional computer, computerized models that you put an algorithm and you get an output. We don't work that way. Yeah. So this is, that's a beautiful example. So it's, it's a similar to eating food. We know what healthy foods are. Plant-based diet, whole foods, no sugars. Yeah, no, <laughs> you golf. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna go for one. But basically, you know, eat healthy. Yeah. We know what healthy food is. Yeah. But what do we have for lunch? What do we have for breakfast? What on earth did you have for lunch, bro? Yeah? yeah. So there is a gap between what we know and our intelligence and all the stuff that we have in our minds and what we believe to be true and how we act, right? Yes. So that is similar to the fitra. So we know we have a primary form of knowledge within us that acknowledges Allah that believes that he deserves praise and that is covered because of bad education, bad upbringing, socialization, whatever the case may be. In your own, you, 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 if you want to cover it yourself. Yeah, even your own ego. Yeah. Yeah, it could be spiritual uh, malaise yeah, or diseases, if you like, spiritual diseases of the heart. So the way to awaken that, you're saying, is by different means. And the reason there is a gap is because of that covering. Yeah. Good. So therefore, to, the way to answer the question is, if person is so intelligent and they still don't believe, is because just like the person who is a lung surgeon or a doctor and he's a qualified medical practitioner and yet he smokes in the evenings. He knows smoking causes cancer and is really bad for you, but he still does it. So his knowledge, his abstract rational thinking, that kind of medical algorithm he has in his mind has done nothing to awaken his fitra. So, but the question that I want to ask you then, what does that person therefore need? If rationality for them doesn't work, what do they need? Now, what we don't want to do, and we teach this in our training as well, is not to judge a person. Right? Yeah, of course, absolutely. But we, it's good to stereotype sometimes. <laughs> so sometimes imagine there's a person who you can feel they have a little bit of arrogance, they feel like they don't need God and so on and so forth. It's actually good to remind there's consequences of this particular thing. For example, I was with a agnostic, uh, a brother who used to be an agnostic, he used to be an atheist and he became a Muslim. And we went down to Speaker's Corner to give da'wah. And I thought, you know, I thought subconsciously, I thought maybe I know more than him because I deal with these guys all the time. There's a woman that came and she said, I'm an atheist. And instead, and this guy actually knows how to show the existence of God and this, uh, so on and so forth. He didn't explain to her why God exists rationally. He explained to her the benefits of believing in God and how it's going to make her happier and a better person and so on and so forth. And afterwards he said to me, I knew she thought in her heart she doesn't need God so no amount of rationality was going to impact her. Wow. This is his own psychology because he used to be one. So what I did instead is I gave her reasons why the belief in God is going to benefit her before I gave her rationality. Mm. So we have to be psychologists. We have to realize, okay, do you know what, this guy, he thinks he's going to live forever, he's got this. Sometimes with the person, you may have to remind them about the pleasures of paradise. Sometimes you may have to remind the person about the pains of the hereafter. Yes. But you have to, you have to do a sort of priming for them. Well, and, that, and the only way you could prime is by sincerely engaging with people in a human way. Yeah. How, how are you going to get to know them? How many times has an atheist come to 
a, a, a table that you're giving Islamic literature and they've introduced themselves kindly saying, Hi, my, my name is John, I'm an atheist. And automatically, just because you've heard that word or that label, you basically said, right, he loves science, he loves Richard Dawkins, I'm going to give him some kind of abstract cosmological argument. And then you guys argue until the cows come home, nothing really happens. You probably got some doubts in the process. And the guy's walking off thinking, you know what, I just wanted an answer of why my mom passed away when I was five years old. And you would never, never have even understood that person or, or what his question was because we've given, we've conveyed the call of Islam to our judgments of the person and not who that person really is. Absolutely. So how are you going to know who that person really is? And I've had this in some conversations before where I'll give a really good argument and then they'll give me some really ridiculous question. And then now I've started to realize, well, that ridiculous question doesn't undermine my argument. And even if I couldn't answer, it doesn't mean anything, right? So for me, that becomes a psychological indicator. This person may have other concerns concerning God and religion and spirituality. And maybe he just wants to interact with a spiritual person or a Muslim in a very positive way. How many times have we seen someone, bro, just by their positive interaction has awakened the truth within? Yeah. And if you remember, so many times. Yeah, absolutely. And do you remember going back in 2010, we were contacted by a doctor. And the doctor, I'm not going to mention his yes, name, of course. very interested in Islam. And he was asking all these very deep philosophical questions. But if you remember, when you really broke down those questions and you asked him, okay, what's the problem? You remember what he said? No, I don't actually. He said, if I become Muslim, my wife will leave me. Yes. Do you remember all yes. of that yes. stuff where he brought up the ancient philosophies about hellfire being a metaphor? Yep. And when it yep. was broken yep. down, yep. the issue was? Yep, his wife. There you go. Yep. So under all of that, there was an emotional, psychological yeah. issue. And the kind of intellectualisms and the rationality was as being used to cover what was really the problem. Absolutely. Yeah, well, humans and beings are like that. Yeah. So, yeah, so what that means is that we need to become more intellectually and spiritually mature if we truly understand this concept of the Islamic first principle which is the fitrah and that it gets clouded there is primary tu truth within us that Allah exists and he deserves worship God exists and he deserves praise and worship and you know if we understand that gets covered then our job is to help them uncover the truth that already exists within them yes. and it's not always just using some kind of rational argument you see this across YouTube and Google and we basically we've lost the plot bro and we, 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 we don't interact with human beings in a human, a human way anymore. And if you look at the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mean, you give me the cosmological argument from the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace. Mm. He, I mean, the way he interacted with human beings in many ways was actually very, uh, you know, psychodynamic. Uh, there was existential argumentation, like about people's purpose and why you're here in the first place. A lot of it was based on psychology. Obviously, he was the best caller to Islam because he was the Prophet. He was Habibullah, the love of Allah. And he was the, the final Prophet. And he knew how to uncover the, you know, the clouding of the fitrah. He spoke to people differently. Of course he did. And if you, if you uh, and I highly recommend you guys watch this debate. Um, Dan Barker and Hamza had a debate in 2011. And there's one point Dan Barker said something that really gave away his psychology. He said, if I see God. Mm. Remember what he said? That if he say, and you do, you you know, he argues against the existence of God, he writes books against him. So a normal Muslim that meets him will think, okay, I need to give this guy evidence for the existence of God. But yeah, she said, if I see God, I will tell God to go to hell. Yes. So I had nothing to do. And this is... And this for, is a, and yeah, for that, the, the kind of, kind of maybe... Emotional. Would, yeah, maybe the emotional, spiritual arrogance came across. Because if I see God, I would tell God to go to hell, yeah? So, I mean, and this is very important, but what I said previously about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even though he was the best at conveying the call... It, this whole thing, and this leads to the next topic, this whole thing about the fitrah and conveying the call and awakening the truth within, that's all in the hands of Allah. Yes. It's Allah that guides. And, and, and that's why we don't know what Allah would choose as a means to awaken the truth within. Many people, they become Muslim or they understand the reality of who they are and why they are f through rational means. Others through spiritual experiences. Others through positive interactions with other Muslims, other human beings. We don't know what Allah would choose. Our job is to try our best within our human context, try and help them realize what's within, that Allah yes. is a reality and that He deserves praise. Absolutely. So, any other questions you've received? I know you've received a lot of questions this week about this topic. Okay, and this is why we're actually, uh, we're actually covering this topic. One of the questions that we get is that, well, how do you prove the fitrah? So, how do you respond to that? Well, you don't. That's the whole point. 
if something is innately true, it's true by virtue of its existence. It doesn't require proof. Okay. For example, take freedom, right? When, when I did the MA in philosophy, we did the idea of freedom as a module. And we were having this discussion, which was, is freedom intrinsically valuable or is it instrumental? Is it a means to great ends yeah. or is it valuable in and of itself? He said all the philosophers or most of the philosophers say freedom is intrinsically valuable. Then I said something silly, which was, well, how do you know? He said, well, if it's intrinsically valuable, then you don't need to prove it. I said, fine, well, how do you ground that, I said. I changed my question. He said, well, it's based on our intuitions. And then he said, that's all, that's all we have. Yeah. So, you know, just because something, you don't prove something, it doesn't mean that it's not a reality. For yes. example, how do we know our, our mothers gave birth to us? Or the world is real. Or, or the people have minds. Yeah, or the world is real. These are all first principles. For example, even if you do mathematics, even if you do science, it's based on certain first principles that we believe to be true by default. Right, and there's an elephant in the room. That you require in order for you to progress in your f f sphere of knowledge. Right. Now, the question for me it exposes an elephant in the room. It makes an elephant appear. And that is epistemology. Yes. Because subconsciously what they're thinking is and what they've been primed, my daughter watches Postman Pat and these types of programs, and even in those programs, the kids and the other characters are talking about, I have scientific proof. So we've been primed from a young age that science is the only way to, to come to truth. Yes. Which is a presupposition to that question. Yes. And that is what the main thing that we need to deal with in order to deal with this particular issue. Well, the easiest way to deal with it sometimes is, is by showing that everything has an assumption. You know when, you know, I know this sounds a bit weird, but you know, when I had the debate with Professor Krauss, I said to him, you have, a you have a metaphysical presupposition that the only way to come to truth is by touching and feeling, essentially, right? And he was like, yes, I do the science. And I was like, but there are other sources of knowledge. He was like, what? And I said, like, testimony. He started laughing. And then he <laughs> sniggered at me. And I said, he said, I just do the science. And I said, well, do you believe in evolution? He said, yes. And I basically said to him, have you done all the science? He said, no. Everyone laughed at him because... It's testimony. Because it, it, it was an evidence of my point, which was that he relies, so, he relies on something outside of science as a source of knowledge for his so-called truth. And that was the say-so of other scientists, which is not scientific, it's testimonial. And if you study epistemology, it's uh, testimony. Is actually it's a majority a, of your beliefs. Is a, it's a majority of your beliefs and it's a fundamental, fundamental and valid source of knowledge. Now, the, the reason I'm mentioning this story is to show that, that if you, if you, sometimes you don't have to answer the question. Just turn the table and say, well, you have first principles too. And which first principles actually are more coherent? So you may have a first principle of, you know, everything is just physical. That could be your first principle, right? Say it's like a, an assumption of naturalism. Like, like Michael Roos, he says this about naturalism. Yeah, he so says faith, yeah, if you consider philosophical naturalism as a metaphysical thesis, that there is no divine, there is no supernatural, everything can be reduced and explained to physical processes, that's the lenses that you start off with in order to see the world. You start, yeah. and that's why even the atheist Professor Michael Roos is that if you want a concession, that naturalism is an act of faith. So you have to just believe that to be true in order to help you understand the whole world. Yeah. Now that first principle, if you like, is incoherent. If you put the Islamic lenses on, which is the principles of, of the fitrah, that you know, Allah exists and, that he, and he deserves praise, that first principle not only makes sense of the physical world, because Islam teaches us that we understand the physical world the way the physical world is and we see that everything is that there are asbab there are physical causes in the universe in order for, under, for us to understand god's will and what happens in the universe so we do the science we understand things can be physical but the first principle of the fitra makes sense of your existential questions about the why about why am i here where am i going what am i supposed to do naturalism you can't even ask, ask the question. Not only that, bro, the fitra makes sense of our understanding of objective moral truths. Because another uh, discussion amongst the Islamic scholars that within the fitra is basic morality, understanding of basic objective morals. The fitra also makes sense of purpose of life, consciousness. of the why. It yeah. makes sense of consciousness. Our reason. It makes sense of so many different things. So if you were to compare first principles, say take the first principle of naturalism, the first principle of the fitra, for example, and to compare the two, well, the fitra accepts aspects of naturalism, that there is a physical world and it can be explained physically, 
But the fitra also allows us to find answers to why am I here? What am I doing? What am I supposed to do? What is good? What is bad? You know, all of these things. And we don't have recalcitrant facts. But for philosophical naturalism, we do. Good, let's explain that. So, um, so with philosophical naturalism, as a worldview, there are facts in existence that resist the first principle or the metaphysical perspective or the philosophical perspective of naturalism. For example... Well, first, there's the... The, the very fact that our consciousness, that we are conscious beings. Yeah, so we it has to assume that the brain, the, the mind is simply the brain at work. Yes. It's all physical. So, you know, it, it, it would have to deny a kind of that we have inner subjective conscious states from that point of view. It have to be explained physically in some way, which in my view, it can't. Um, another recalcitrant fact, a fact that resists the kind of theory the of the or first principle of the universe is, so the first principle of naturalism is the beginning of the universe. You know, how do we explain that metaphysical event, right? Um, so there's so many things that we objective morals, are now we are encountering, like objective morals, that are really resisting the idea that everything can be reduced to physical processes. But the concept of the fitra, what is there in the world that is resisting the concept of the fitra? I in mean, fact, like, it, let's, let's, let's be real about this. Yeah, it gives you more explanatory oxygen, if you like, because it, it doesn't deny certain things. Imagine this, right? You've got one worldview which says you've got three doors that you can leave a building. One worldview which says you've only got a window which is one inch wide. Which way are you going to go with? In the Islamic worldview, you've got more doors. You've got more space. But here we've got a lot of restriction. And what's really interesting is that, and I, and I spoke about this. In so that's really funny. It, it makes the Islamic first principle, it, it makes you more open-minded. Of course it does. <laughs> that's <laughs> the irony. And it's interesting that you mentioned about Michael Roos, uh, the philosophy of science, mentioned that philo philosophical naturalism is a... Faith yes. is something that you start off with. In today's world, that assumption <coughs> has almost been misunderstood as a prediction. We've discovered philosophical naturalism. No, no, no we, we haven't. We started with it. We started with it. And yeah. this is a big conflation which we also need to maybe address yeah, absolutely. in the future. Yeah. Yeah. So, where are we so far? So, we've discussed the first principles. Yeah. Everything has first principles and assumptions. We discussed the role of the fitra, that's our first principle, but it gets clouded. The way to uncloud it is not only using rational arguments. We need to be more intellectual and spiritually mature to understand that it could be positive interaction and other things that can awaken the truth within. Then it led us to make us understand, well, can you prove the fitra? Well, it's a first principle. First principles you start off with and you believe them to be true by default in order for you to understand yourself and reality. And well, the, the thing that you can discuss though is what first principles are more coherent in order to allow you to understand yourself and reality. Well, if you compare naturalism, for example, philosophical naturalism, which, as we said, just denies the divine from the default, says everything could be explained by physical processes. If you, if you, if you see philosophical naturalism and the fitra, which accepts that there's physical processes, but it allows you to understand existential spiritual realities of life, then which one explains reality better? It gives you explanatory power. Yeah, it gives you explanatory power. It's not... Uh, philosophical naturalism because it doesn't allow you to go into the why per se purpose for things it doesn't allow you to go into the fact that you know you're a spiritual being with with the in, inner subjective conscious states that are not cannot be reduced physically yeah. you know it, it doesn't allow you to dwell into these matters it can't even explain objective moral truth and all of these and you'd things you have to de deny your free will i mean it is well, you have to deny what makes you human yeah but if you take the fitra, yes, we accept those physical processes, we accept science, we accept that there's the physical causes in the universe, but also this first principle allows you to understand or allow, gives you the explanatory scope and power to basically understand the world as it is, that you're here with a purpose, there are objective moral truths, you know, the concept of spirituality, we have existential questions, why am I here, where am I going? So you can't compare the two and, well, frankly, I'll have the one that leaves my mind open. Absolutely. Because philosoph philosophical naturalism closes your mind from the beginning. You have to belie believe from the beginning, as the lenses you put on your eyes to understand reality, that there is no divine and that everything can be reduced to physical process. If you start with that, then you're never going to see the divine. If you start with that, then all you're going to see is physical processes. Yeah. Well, why start with that? Covering your eyes and saying there's no sun, essentially. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Good point. So, what next? Since we're near the end of the segment, I thought it'd be a good plug to speak about the failed hypothesis book because that the last chapter is going to be on this very issue. Yes, uh, we have a book that we're co-authoring, Alhamdulillah, which is called 
the failed hypothesis, and I forgot the subtitle. Essays on... Essays on X, Y, and Z. Yes. And uh, it should be coming out this year, inshallah. After Ramadan, inshallah. And everything that we spoke about is going to be explained in a little bit more detail in one of those essays and, and, uh, and essays throughout, inshallah. So keep tuned. Let's take some questions, if you don't mind, bro. So I have to get a bit close because we're using the phone. Just bear with me. Maybe Saqib here could tell us the questions. I could the questions. Yeah, if you don't mind, bro. Uh, you don't have to scroll give through. us some questions. Sorry for my finger here. Okay, go. The admin, can you save the videos on YouTube? Okay. We're just waiting okay. for the okay. questions, guys. Say yep. more. Says, I totally disagree with you about your comments in the Quran and science. So, did you make any specific comments about the Quran and science? No, this is probably another <laughs> thing. That, another thing we've been pushing that uh, there are no. Inverted commas scientific miracles in the Quran, but we can't explain it now. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, just type in Hamza Dress Tools on YouTube, go to the channel. The first is a webinar that goes in detail concerning how to understand Quran and the science and moving away the kind moving away from the kind of modernite idea that there are scientific miracles in the Quran. Because if you understand the philosophy of science, if you, if you understand Islamic epistemology and all of these things, you'd realize that there are no scientific miracles. It's an oxymoron. Basically, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Uh, but go, go to that webinar. Uh, if you don't find it satisfactory, then contact me and uh, inshallah, God willing, I'll address some of your questions. All right, got a question here from Abara Samar Samara. And she asks, how can you prove to non-Muslims that the fitra exists though? Just because we all agree that lying is wrong, doesn't mean it's due to fitra. Atheists can say our brain developed. I mean, I mean, it just stopped there. But yeah, how can we prove that the fitra exists? Well, uh, yeah, well, we addressed this in the conversation that, well, first principles do not require proof. You need those first principles or assumptions or metaphysical first principles in order for you to actually develop and progress in your area of knowledge. For example, science will never work. You will have no scientific conclusions if you didn't adopt the first principle of nature's exactly. uniform. Yep. External causal connections. For example, neuroscience will never be neuroscience if it didn't adopt the first philosophical principle that can't be proven scientifically, by the way, that things can be reduced physically, which is called physicalism in the philosophy of the mind. The point is, you can't, this, we're not telling you this to use it as a proof for anything. It's for you to understand that reality, and therefore it shapes the way you address other people and you have conversations with people. For example, if you know that within this non-Muslim, they have the innate nature that God exists and He deserves praise, and your job is to help uncloud that innate nature because it's been clouded because of socialization or education or whatever the case may be, then you know that rational arguments may not work. Yeah. The rational arguments are just a means, not an end, and they may not work. So therefore, it gives you this intellectual and spiritual maturity to basically engage in a more positive way and m maybe realize what would work is buying them a pizza or, 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 or having a coffee with oh, them. Definitely. And I just wanted to add to this that a practical way it would have helped is many, many years ago when I used to study at school, in high school, there was a non-Muslim guy who I sometimes, I, we had a discussion about religion. He was an atheist. He was very anti-religion. And only later did I discover that when he was a child, his mother committed suicide in front of him. So, knowing this now, there was no point of me previously trying to speak to him using any form of rationality. Maybe, you know, chapter 18 of the Quran would have been something better. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is, this is a very powerful, liberating Dawah tool. Okay, uh, Ayaz Nur just asked, would you suggest before beginning a conversation with anyone, assuming they will truly reveal their problems with God, Islam, in the conversation to ask what their first principles are and how would you do so? So how would... I think it's... He's trying to say first principles are subjective, I think. Okay, well, look. Um, maybe we could both answer this. Maybe if he... he I'm, I'm, I wouldn't go up to someone saying what are your first principles because they may not even know what their first principles are. Some of them I assume that you don't even know. Like how many times have I spoken to people who are even intelligent and the academics and they forget and they don't even have in the forefront of mind that actually 
all of this sphere of knowledge that I'm, I'm, I'm learning actually is based on some fundamental first principles that, unproven. Are, that are unproven. Yeah. Sometimes you just have to remind people. But I don't think that's a very healthy conversation to say, hey, how are you doing, sir? Before we have a discussion, what are your first principles? Uh, that human life is valuable and that you know, we all deserve a chance? Yeah, but I'm saying your philosophical first principles. No, you don't discuss with people like that. What I would say, though, is, is for you to understand that when people do talk, that they have assumptions. For example, when I was at the University of... Southampton? No, there was another one. I forgot what it's called. But we basically had a discussion and someone asked me a question saying, you know what? And oh, it was on worship. And he said, you know what? I didn't ask to be created. I didn't ask for this life. You know? You know I, I didn't ask to be, to be put on this earth to have this test. A lot of people try to answer the question. So I'm not answering the question. I'm going to unravel one of the assumptions behind the question. So the assumption is that you own your life. That's not our metaphysical thesis. With all due respect, you don't own Jack, right? This is a, this is a key part of affirming the oneness of the divine. Allah's rububiya, the fact that he is the master, owner, sustainer, loving, nurturer of everything that exists. So one aspect of God's divine oneness is that he owns everything. So if he owns you, then the question doesn't make sense, right? The question doesn't make sense. You're putting yourself because, oh, sorry, the question really was, I wasn't asked consent to be put on this earth. So you're on par with God. Yeah. So you know, we have a deal. But sorry, that, you're assuming that God has a moral responsibility yeah. to ask you, oh, Saqib, would you like to come down on earth? Oh, soul called <laughs> Saqib, would you like to come to earth? If Allah owns you, does he have a moral responsibility to ask your permission whether you should be on earth or not? No. If I made a Lego house, right, or a car, you know, I'm not going to ask the car, how, oh, sorry car, can I move you to the left please? No, I own the car, I made the car, do you see my point? So there is a kind of uh, naturalistic assumption behind the question. And sometimes it be, you have a more fruitful discussion with people and you unravel those questions, those, uh, those assumptions. And it awakens stuff within them. Oh my God, I've been, I never truly really thought about this before. But what we do, we like to jump into other people's assumptions and we commit epistemicide. Yes. Yeah, we, we, like, we murder our sources of knowledge. Yeah? yeah. And so it's very important to understand that you're not going to now start engaging with people what are your first principles, but it's for you to understand that, hey, that question, does it really require answering? Or, does, or, 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 or what is needed is to unravel the particular assumption behind that question. And once you do so, obviously with compassion and the most intelligent way and with, with mercy and with human engagement, and once you do that, you will empower that person to be able to think. Because sometimes we, have to, we think we have to give people answers all the time. Who do you think you are? Even Allah gives you questions and doesn't give you answers. So, uh, chapter 52, verse 35 to 36. He says, you know, you think you came from nothing? <laughs> right? You, you, you created yourself, you create the heavens and the earth, you have no certainty. Where's the answer? It's implied. It's as if Allah is telling us, if you ask the right questions, it would inevitably lead to the right answers if you have a sincere heart. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just allowing people to think and understand is much better. And that's why yeah. sometimes when an atheist comes, up, some, comes to you and says, no, just an atheist, a skeptic, anyone, they may come up to you and say, hey, I just follow the evidence. What, what do we do sometimes? And you see this on videos. Start giving evidence. You start giving evidence and assuming the type of evidence that they're assuming. But what we should say is, what do you mean by evidence? And then you get them to basically... You, you, you allow people to go on their own intellectual spiritual journey. And some would say, just scientific evidence. Okay, good. So you presume scientism, which is that science is the only method to formulate you know, answers about the world and reality. That's not true. Here's why. You broke that assumption down. That's a far more edifying, educating way in dealing with people. But what we do... We, do you see my point, bro? No, you give us an example in your look, life as well. Look, and absolutely. It's, it's like there's a line here. I've got my assumptions, you've got yours. I just step into yours without even realizing I'm stepping into yours. Now, there's something which uh, we were speaking about first principles. It's sometimes good to have the power of questions to unravel the psychology. So there's this atheist I was speaking to and I could tell that he was one of these people who didn't not want to believe in God. This was my hunch. So instead of giving him more and more rational arguments for God, which we were doing previously, which was my mistake, I said to him, okay, do you know what, my friend, if you saw God, would you spend your life worshipping God? He said no. So that was a problem. It was nothing to do with rationality in the first place. Likewise, some people, they say, I don't believe in God or I don't believe in Islam because you have the hijab 
or you have this thing or you have that thing. And again, you can ask them a question and say, okay, let's imagine that it didn't exist in Islam. Would you spend your time five times a day getting up four o'clock in the morning bound down to God? They say no. So fundamentally, that's the problem. Yes. And that's the power the, of questioning. Yeah, that's why the right question sometimes is, if God did exist, would you worship him? Yes. Absolutely. Do you see the point? And sometimes even when people say God doesn't exist, and you say, well, what type of God are you talking about? That's an assumption too. You're assuming we have the same definition. Because frankly, many people have been brought up with the idea that God is a guy on a cloud with a beard. Throwing I, down lightning. Yes. I, don't, I don't believe in that God. Like I was listening to the head of the American Atheist just last night. And he was saying, you know, we, it's irrational. There's no proof there's a man in the sky on a cloud. Obviously, that was a very crude understanding of even Christian theology. It was a straw man and misrepresentation. Um, but put that aside, the point is, some people have that view. So sometimes you have to ask them, well, what do you mean by God? And sometimes you don't even need to go to any evidence and say, well, this is what I mean by God. He's transcendent. He's unique. He is one. Right? Yeah. He's outside of the universe. He is, you know, uh, unique and, and, and uniquely one. All of those things, like basically sort of ikhlas, the... the 112th chapter of the Quran If you give them that Does that sound reasonable to you? Yeah that sounds reasonable Okay that's the God that I'm talking about And that about. was actually my first Dawah conversation with an atheist uh, She was a Christian woman Who left Christianity Became an atheist And we were speaking about The existence of God in Kingston This is 2010 I didn't know how to give Rational arguments for God So she was describing God In a very physical human way So I just took out Chapter 112 of the Quran And I said This is what we believe about God He is one He is unseen Unique This 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 the first thing she said is that makes sense. Yeah. She didn't even, like you said, absolutely, she didn't want rational evidence. Her conception of God was false. Yes. And once that was clarified, and this is why what we need to do is we need to be proud of the first principles. We need to not yeah, be shy and, oh, you know, we've got this it's secret It's so liberating, figure. but you have to do it in a non-arrogant way. As I said, I've mentioned this before on Facebook Live, um, with, with, with forbearance, with hilm, with humanity, with mercy, with love, with compassion, in accordance with the sunnah, the prophetic, you know, approach of the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that's very important for us to understand, but it's a very liberating moment. Yep. Because sometimes even people make moral claims, bro. They say, this is evil, right? You know, and you're like, oh my God, I need to now try to unravel why it's not evil. Just say to them, well... Within a liberal framework. Yeah, within a, within a liberal secular framework, for example. Say, well... Your assumption is X, Y, and Z. Can I explain why that assumption is false? And you deal with, 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 with humility and humanity. Like some people may see some of the legal rulings in Islam as, oh my God, what's going on here? Obviously because they're ignorant, they don't understand them, they don't understand the ethics of Islam. But that is usually made from a point of view that, you know, um, my, my, their conception of individualism, Western right. individualism is actually true. You just said, well, let me just unravel that for you and explain to you why that might not be the case. And you compassionately engage with other people and get them to think. Um, there was another issue about a European bias, for example. I mentioned yes. this in University of Southampton, that people have a Eurocentric historical bias uh, concerning religion. And they're like, you hear it all the time, all religions create wars. So when you understand the concept of principles and assumptions, you'll be able to understand this question. So usually, when people ask a Muslim, all religions create wars, what do we do? We explain why they don't. We say, why would they do? Yeah, no, religions don't create wars. Or what we say is, um, Islam is peace, right? Or what we say is, you create wars. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you create this ridiculous, ridiculous argument. But what, what's behind that person? There's a few assumptions. Number one, that history started 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, which is not true. And number two, which is more fundamental, that we've been brought up as Westerners in Europe with this historical bias or historic Eurocentric perspective on hi religious history. Because if you study the European West, it suffered because of religion. You had the 16th century Christian Reformation. You had you know, Martin, scientists, Martin yeah. Luther pegging on a church door in a, in a German church door in Wittenberg, his thesis attacking the Catholic tradition. Because the Catholic state at that time would use the coercive arm of the state to prevent thinking, right? You would have, and that, you know, because of trade rights and other things, you had the 30-year wars, the 80-year wars, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day. I mean, Europe was suffering because of, you know, the perceived actions of religious, you know, tyranny. So they've taken that specific European context. And obviously now because of 9-11 and all these things that are happening around the world and terrorism and extremism, X, Y, and Z, they put that all together and they're like, Religion causes wars. And we just need to show to them, well, that comes from a historical premise that is, that, that is basically Eurocentric. If you understand Islam in its 
totality, not just the past 30 years, you see some had a different relationship between power and people. And it, science and yeah, religion. Yeah, and science and religion was a little yeah. bit more positive, right? And that, at least if you explain that and you unravel that assumption, it gets them to think. You don't have to give them an answer. You don't have to force it down their throats. Yeah. But at least it gets them to think now. Do you see my point? So this whole first principles thing is not only powerful for yourself in understanding human beings and how to approach them when you're conveying the call. It's not only powerful when it comes to Islamic epistemology and you thinking that my faith is going to be certain only if you have this rational algorithm, which is not true. But it also helps you in normal discussions and discourse by understanding that things have first principles and premises and assumptions behind them that may be wrong and incoherent and my job as a compassionate human being, Muslim, is to help them understand that so they could go on their intellectual and spiritual journey. Absolutely. Any other questions? From Sadat Noman Khan. Uh, okay, let's, let's give this one a try. The first principle so, why would anyone choose fitra over physical naturalism? Are you putting forward a principle to ration, rationalize the first principle? No. We actually covered this in the talk. Yeah. You see, firstly. I repeat the question so they could hear it. Yeah, sure. Okay. No, so we'll repeat the question. Oh, I repeat the question. Um, Sadat Noman. The first principle, so why would anyone choose fitra over physical naturalism? Are you putting forward a principle to rationalize the first principle? No, this is putting the cart before the horse. Firstly, whether you believe in religion or you don't, you believe in God or you don't, first principles are there. So let's disagree about that. First principles are there. Okay, so somebody comes along with their first principles, I come along with my first principles. Now we're not going to do it like this, I prefer vanilla ice cream and you prefer chocolate ice cream. So you go your way, I go my way. No, we're going to say, look, <coughs> there's a hierarchy of first principles. So your first principle is physical naturalism, and my first principle is the fitra. Okay, let's see what makes more sense of the world. Yeah. So, in terms of my first principle, I can trust my reason because ultimately we were created by God and God is the one who designed us, so we were, we were not created through this blind process which is indifferent to truth, which only cares about survival. In your case, no. Okay, we can believe in the mind not being reducible to the brain, so we can believe in a form of consciousness as well. Can you? No, you can't. The beginning of the universe, does that make more sense under the fitra or make more sense under physical naturalism? Makes more sense under here. So we can have this discussion. It's not just going to be simply an arbitrary thing. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to choose this and yeah. you're actually going to choose that. And we're not, you, we're, not, we're not discussing the coherence of the first principles, which one's more coherent in understanding ourselves and reality to prove the fitra. No. Yes. And we're not doing it, we're not adopting the fitra in order to prove God's existence. You're missing the point. We're saying you can still have good rational arguments for God's existence. I actually believe there are rational arguments for God's existence. Absolutely, but you're missing the point here. Those rational arguments only become means, if understood properly, to awaken that truth within. They're not ends in themselves. But in an abstract conversation, if you were to ask me, do we have rational philosophical evidence for the existence of God? Yes, we do. Of Absolutely. course we do. But when, so we're not adopting the fitra to, exp to, to somehow... Uh, you know, explain God, right, or, or, or proof for God, you're missing the fundamental point. No, absolutely, it's, it's just about going as far as you can with the explanatory sort of power and, see, and seeing how far it can actually go. And one example which we didn't speak about, which I think is very powerful, is let's assume two different worldviews. So Hamza is going to assume the worldview of the fitra, and I'm going to say start off with the worldview of uh, physical naturalism. Now, there is an observed reality out there, and the observed reality out there is human beings have a sanctification instinct. Yes. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, in which generations of people were taught, you know, Marxism, communism, Darwinism, materialism, that atheism is right. They, they had state atheism in which they mocked religions, closed down churches, synagogues, mosques, persecuted religious people, taught them scientific Scientism basically primed them for that. After the collapse of the Berlin Wall, within a few decades, people became religious again. Yes. And even during the Soviet campaign, what did they do? They turned Lenin into a god. They actually, if you look, they have a mausoleum, and they, they had, I think, over um, a, a couple of thousand statues across of him in, 
in uh, the Soviet Union. So, okay, what makes more sense? So you've got the fitra, I've got physical naturalism. Well, it makes more sense yeah. under the fitra view. So, yeah, you know, so, so basically what you're saying is that we have a instinct to worship, which is to revere something and, and, and adore something the most and want to know something the most and, and, and use it as a reference the most or obey it the most and to direct acts of worship like gratitude towards something the most so since and i mentioned this in a previous um, facebook live so since we all have this drive to almost worship if you define worship in, in from what i've just said then you know what makes sense of that drive to worship yeah that's the point yeah. and then the issue of communist russia when communism fell, then people started to become religious again because they had a way to express that instinct. Absolutely. Now, philosophical naturalism, it can't explain that instinct. In fact, even in The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins speaks about the enigma of religion being a really hard problem. For example, I'm being chased by a bear, say Hamza's the bear, and I'm running, running, running to save my life. The best thing for me to do is to adopt a type of pure naturalism, right? If I run faster, if I eat these types of food, if I do this, I'm going to survive. If I stop and start praying to a higher being to protect me while I'm being chased by the bear, that doesn't help my survival. So from a, phys from a physical naturalism point of view, the religion is an enigma. The belief in God, and you know, uh, there's actually a lot of literature uh, on this particular topic. Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to first principles, going back to the question, we can make a case for why the fitra makes a lot of sense. And in fact, minus God... The other things which people accept, even atheists accept, and they, they, they hold up in high esteem, such as human rights and these sorts of things, these things cannot be explained under physical naturalism. Philosophical like, naturalism. Right, yeah. Philosophical naturalism. For example, perception of color, right? I mean, um, the leaves are not actually green. Green is the color which is reflected off. Likewise, morality is not out there. It's actually a, a collective fiction according to naturalists. Yeah. This is what they actually call it, yeah, some an illusion of the yeah. genes, yeah, so, right? So, 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 some, some naturalists. I'm talking about evolutionary yeah. naturalists. But you know the question itself has a first principle, as an assumption. Because, well, in a way, what you could do is just reverse it, say fine. Well, we could just argue that someone just adopted that external physical causes in the universe exist, that someone just adopted that, uni that, that nature is uniform, in order for science to work. You could just, you could just turn the tables. So if someone says, Hamza, you've made up the fitra, right? Or first principles. The, or first principles. You've made up the idea of first principles in order for you to justify God's existence. Like, okay, well, you've made up your first principles <laughs> to justify your physicalist conclusions. Yeah. Just turn the tables. Although, obviously, the point here is we're not, we didn't compare and show the coherence of our first principles to prove the first principle. That wasn't the point. So it's a bit of a... Um, it's a good question, but misplaced from that point of view. One more question, maybe? Okay, this is a very general question. Uh, when a non-Muslim says, I don't have a lot of time to read the Qur'an, can you please just explain what Islam is about? How would one reply to this? Which points should we mention? Okay, good. So, Bo, you go first. So, the question was, brothers and sisters, if someone, a non-Muslim says to you, I don't have time to read the Qur'an, whatever the case may be, um, just, just quickly explain to me what Islam is about. What would you say? So let's hear Sabur's, then I'll try and end it. <laughs> the Quran, in terms of its main message, is not about don't do this and don't do that. It's about a relationship between the creator and the creation and a direct relationship. And if you look at the spread of Islam, the early spread of Islam in the Middle East and also the spread of Islam in the West today, and the spread of Islam wherever it's gone, even in India, China, whatever, the main thing which attracted people is that there is nothing in between a human being and their Lord. And this is the main message of the Qur'an. I totally agree. So I would argue the main message of Islam is that you have a creator and he is unique and independent and you were placed on this earth to worship him. We all worship something, but we have misdirected worship. But we have to understand the one that is worthy of that worship is Allah the one that deserves worship, he deserves to be known, to be loved, to be obeyed, and to direct all our internal and external acts of worship to him alone. Although he doesn't need it, we need it because it defines who we are. As Allah says in the Quran, those who forgot Allah, Allah will make them forget their own selves. It's as if our understanding of who we are is dependent and contingent with our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. We'll bring Subur more often. Alhamdulillah, I'll see you on Wednesday, inshallah, 8 p.m. BST time, British summer time, okay? 
and I don't know what time it will be in your area of the world, but may Allah bless you, whoever you are, Muslim, non-Muslim, may Allah bless you, keep you happy, uh, guide you, um, shower you with his abundant mercy and love. From Sabur, Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.